Good morning, everybody. So glad you could join us here today on Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. Well, it's been a big week. Earth Day and Arbor Day both fell this week. Yeah. And finally, it feels like spring actually know, got here with some nice, warm, sunny days. Exactly. When we decided that Earth Day and, and Arbor Day are two big a days to just do it on a day. So this is Earth, Earth Day week and Arbor Day weekend. Yeah, so, absolutely. So we extend it a little bit on right. our own. So take advantage of the of the time and the and the reason, and go plant something beautiful in your landscape. Yeah, I was telling you, I heard just an interesting news uh, news article. I was coming on the radio mm -hmm. the other day talking about Arbor Day and the value of trees. And I guess they were talking about this computer program that was developed to look at the value of trees, what they do in terms of carbon se sequestration, you know, production of oxygen. Uh, protecting our water quality and all the benefits, the cooling from the shade and everything. And they were, came up with this equation, basically says for every dollar spent on planting trees, it returns about three dollars as far as uh, energy savings and environmental costs. So that's a pretty good investment right there. Really, really, that's a great, uh, great thing to know. So, well, we've got a great show for you today. David has some proven performers that he's gonna share for you today. Well, not just David got some help today. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that to me really differentiates Maryfield Garden Center, I think one of the things that's not just the quality of the plants and the selection we offer, but also the quality of the people right. um, that are there to support and help you their decision making. So I am featuring plants that have proven themselves to be dependable and reliable, but it's also an opportunity to introduce some of our staff and some of our people that come with so much enthusiasm and background as well. So we do have uh, some video segments mm -hmm. that we're going to use throughout the program we are, where we were out at our Fair Oaks store and get a chance to not only see the plants, but also meet some of our people. That's great. I'd love to be able to film and bring these segments in. Well, before we get started, we've, we've got a great seminar for you, two great seminars for you this weekend at our Gainesville location. And they are, these are actually the last two seminars of the Winter Spring Series. Now, we'll be having more seminars kind of throughout the summer and that type thing. And, and the next set will start in the fall, of course. But uh, you, if you haven't been to any, this is the perfect time to start. And it's a great ending, very exciting because we've brought in uh, Andre Viet, the exciting world of perennials with Andre Viet today at 1.30 p.m. Again, this is at our Gainesville location, and please take note of the time. That's 1.30 p.m. rather than the 10 o'clock that our sa Saturday seminars usually are. Uh, and that's because he is doing his radio show this morning, uh, which he does, I believe, in this area. It's called In the, in the Garden with Andre Viet. I believe it airs on WINC, which I think is 1400 radio in, in our area. Uh, but he's going to be doing that from our Gainesville location this morning, and Peggy is going to be on at the 9 o'clock hour with him. And so it's a call-in show. You can, you can call in with, with your questions. So Peggy, Peggy and Andre will be. He's in, been in the business now. His son Mark has continued. So it's like having three generations right. almost of experience built in there when you get the call in. And, and when you come down to the show, of course, you know, not only is a hybridizer and an author and a lecturer and doing the shows, but he also runs tours around the world. So uh, Andre just brings this huge, diverse background. And so it's a very, very special opportunity. And he, uh, Mark told me, his son Mark told me that Andre is bringing 10 of his newest daylilies uh, to raffle off, not raffle off, but as door prizes, um, part of a raffle after the uh, seminar today. So another great reason to, to be there. So, and this is sponsored uh, by Bonide, by the way, which, is, which are great products. Oh, so, they are, yeah. We've yeah. been selling them because they're good products, and so that's definitely exactly. a good, good company to be so, representing. So take advantage, 1.30 this afternoon at our Gainesville location. And then tomorrow, our very last seminar of, this, of the season, Paul McLean's going to be talking about growing beautiful roses. So gro growing roses is so rewarding. So please take advantage of this seminar, and he's going to tell you how to care for them, show some of the different varieties, that type of thing. And I know... <laughs> My husband, Rob, our roses, we got a huge shipment of roses yesterday at the Fair Oaks location, so I'm sure they came to all three locations. So Rob spent all of yesterday and last night, and he's over there this morning getting them all in and categorized and, and ready for you. So. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, we just got stocked up on them, right. so that's nice if you can come to the seminar and learn how about them, learn how to grow them, uh, and then go out and actually purchase some. Absolutely. 
Okay, well before we get started with our proven performers, you've got a couple of tips to go over. I do, since we're talking about plants and we're talking about the pretty side of gardening, I was going to just start a little bit of a, an important tip and what's happened. I know I talk about weeds quite a bit, um, but this can be like the last time I bring it up for a while. But I have to tell you, Debbie, it seems like the past three, four weeks or so at the plant clinic, all we're looking at is weeds. Yes. Everybody's just bringing in different weeds, all the different problems that they're seeing out there. And so I want to just kind of do a quick recap on this. And I've got a couple pictures uh, to sort of kick this off. So uh, I hope this does not look like your lawn. No, no. our lawn is actually looking quite nice right now. Yeah, but um, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the extreme case. But what you're looking at, this is a picture I went out and I think I took on Tuesday. So this is pretty close to real time if you go out there. And what's in this picture, it's, um, you can't differentiate them, but there's a lot of this is chickweed, kind of sprawly stuff. There's the dead nettle, which has the little flowers on there. Uh, bitter cress is another one that's in there. Uh, the thing is, these are all what we call winter weeds. They grow during the cool season of the year. They grow during the fall, the winter, the spring. Uh, they're flowering now. A lot of them are going to seed. So these winter weeds are really at their full peak maturity. Trying to go out and get control of them now is difficult because the weed killers that we apply to them are synthetic forms of growth regulators. They're absorbed into the plant. They disrupt the cell division of the plant. But when they're already mature, when they've reached the point where they're flowering and bearing their seeds, there's really no growth taking place. You don't get a good absorption. You don't get good control. So going out the weed killer right now uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because they're sort of at the end of their cycle. They're going to be fading out. Uh, if this is me, I'd just go mow the area with um, you know, bagger to collect the seeds, maybe do some hand pulling. But in our next slide, what I want to show are the summer weeds because as these weeds are dying out, the summer annual weeds start to fill in. So I think what's really, really important now that we're getting the warmer temperatures is to be proactive, get a weed preventer down so that we don't encounter these kind of problems. So this is what I'm saying. This is it's really time sensitive. Uh, you need to get out there very soon if you haven't already and get a weed preventer down. Now there's many different ones for different weeds and situations, but the couple I wanted to show you is this one again. It's from Bonide. It's um, the crabgrass uh, weed preventer. This Bonide product, what's kind of nice about it is that it can be used both in lawns as well as garden beds. So you can use it in both applications. This can here treats about 2,600 square feet. Uh, so it's a convenient size for smaller properties. And you just sprinkle it on right out of the can. I love this, this handle container. It is. It, they just came out with it this year, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad to have it because it is easy and convenient. And like I said, uh, this does not kill weeds. This will not get rid of weeds that are already there. You need to pull them out, but then you apply that to prevent new ones coming back in. And that's going to give you good control for about 12, maybe, maybe 16 weeks at a time. So I emphasize you have to do repeat applications right. about every 12 weeks. Okay. I'll take this away and the bring The other up. one I'm going to show you, because I just like to give a couple choices out there. Gallery is a, uh, is a great weed preventer. It doesn't have quite as broad a spectrum on the weeds it controls as the other one does. But the nice thing here is gallery can last you for up to five months. So this maybe you can get by with both a spring and a late summer application. Again, that's for both lawns and garden beds. Nobody really enjoys weeding, so if, uh, right. if you can get ahead of the problem and start doing these preventive treatments, it makes your gardening a lot more enjoyable. Okay, great. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have some great ideas for your garden, and then later on the show, we'll take your phone calls. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. We're talking about proven performers today, great plants for your landscape, and uh, not just David's opinion, but we've got a, a couple of extra opinions. So first we're going to talk to Mike Fahey, Michael Fahey. Yes, I had decided I was having a conversation with a customer about, oh, don't plant this, don't plant that, and I realized, no, what I really need is a little more positive outlook, and so we want to feature the ones that are really tried and true. These may not necessarily be the newest plants, mm -hmm. but they're the ones that we know are reliable, we can depend on. 
And I thought it'd be fun, like I said, to go around the garden mm -hmm. center and ask some of our different specialists right. which ones they would recommend. So Michael Fay is a good horticulturist. He he's, loves the wildflowers mm -hmm. and the, the annuals and the perennials and the shrubs and the greenhouse plants, but his real passion is in the trees, in the tree section. He is a certified arborist, uh, has been working this for several years, so we started out speaking with Michael Fay and asking him to show us his proven performers. So let's take a look. Good morning. Morning, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Now, you've been hard at work here trying to select those tough, reliable trees. Absolutely, and this is one of my favorites. Um, one of the most durable shade-providing canopy trees from northern Maine all the way down to southern Florida along the east coast is Acer rubrum, red maple. Um, known for its spectacular fall color, also for its spring flowering, which if you look up into the forest line about a week ago, you'd get a great haze of red flowers. Uh, it's not as ornamental as your Japanese cherries, but it's a beautiful overall flowering cycle. Yeah, I know I recommend all these trees all the time because they are so tough and durable. I've seen them in parking lots as well as people's homes. Absolutely, and they tolerate wet conditions as well as drought conditions. It's a very versatile tree. And if you're looking for something to give you a shade providing canopy quickly, red maple is a great option. Absolutely. Now you offer several different varieties here to choose from. We do. We've got um, several different cultivars, uh, two of which our most popular favorites are Red Sunset and October Glory. Um, we also have Red Point as well as Autumn Blaze, which are known for fall color and are hybrids. Uh, we also have um, columnar red maples, which would be like Bow Hall and Armstrong. If you don't have quite the space but you want that fall and spring color, that's another great option. Absolutely. That's definitely a reliable shade tree. Uh, any other tips before we move on? No, I think that would be about all. We can move on to Japanese maples. All right, let's go take a look. Great. Okay, Michael, in our search for proven reliable trees, you've chosen another maple to show us. Uh, yes, I have. And here we are with Acer Palmatum. This is Japanese maple. Um, we're standing here next to one of our most popular varieties. This is called Bloodgood. Bloodgood is, um, is a beautiful upright Japanese maple. You can see the color of the foliage here, which is going to hold true through spring and summer. Fall color on Bloodgood looks like somebody's uplighting the tree. It just sets the tree on, it illuminates the whole tree, it makes it glow, it's beautiful. Right, so these would be nice specimen trees. They don't get near as large as the red maples we were looking at before. Absolutely, the red maples we were looking at before would be shade providing trees. Um, Japanese maples, especially Bloodgood, is gonna be a much smaller tree in the scheme of things, closer to 20, 25 foot mature size. Yeah, very versatile group and hard to believe that it's in the same family, same genus as these. Absolutely, and this is just another type of Japanese maple. These are lace leaf Japanese maples. Um, we call them dissectums. You can see this beautiful, delicate texture in the foliage here. Um, the greens are some of my favorite because the fall color on these looks like somebody set the tree on fire. I mean, it's just beautiful shades of scarlet and orange. is very bright and vivid. But really, it's that form, that weeping form, I think also makes them stand out. Absolutely. I like to do a little pruning in there and open up and really show them off. Potentially even raise the canopy so you can see the trunk structure because they are such beautiful trees. Now, this is something different. This is another one of my favorites. This one we call Lion's Head. This is Shishigashira. Um, again, another green Japanese maple. It isn't upright, but going to have a smaller mature size, closer to 10 or 15 feet. Um, you can see it keeps this very dense habit. The leaves are a lot closer together and much smaller. Uh, the fall color on this, again, is, is stunning. Just like the lace leaf green is going to have this beautiful shade of scarlet and orange throughout. Yeah, really spectacular, and, and it is a diverse group of plants. It is. This is another one. Um, this is another type of Japanese maple. We call this full moon or fern leaf Japanese maple. You can see, again, that delicate texture in the leaf is very fern-like. Same thing. The other green Japanese maples have a beautiful fall display. This one, too. It's a little different, though. It's not going to be that bright orange color. It's going to be a little bit more like this red lace leaf. It's going to have a really deep crimson red through and through. Right, and that's nice to show up. We looked at the lace leaf, the green leaf, and of course, lace leaf of that deep burgundy color. And here it color. is. Here's the other lace leaf with the red color. Same thing. This is going to have this color through and through, through spring and summer. It's going to be absolutely stunning tree in a landscape. Great spot is anywhere you have a small constricted area, you really need a small display tree. This is the one. Now, people, they always look so delicate. People are always asking me, you know, are, do they require special care or any pointers in that regard? And I would typically say Japanese maples out as, a, as a whole are very durable trees. I mean, very tolerant of a wide variety of conditions. You know, full sun, also one of our favorite shade tolerating trees as well. 
And that's what I found as well. So an excellent choice for our durable, reliable trees. Thank you. Great. Now you've got another one you want to show us, right? We'll head over to Red Buds, absolutely. Okay. Okay, Michael, we've looked at a couple of maples, the red maple, the Japanese maple. What's next? Uh, here we are in red buds. Uh, red buds are a gorgeous spring flowering tree, as you all know. You may not know there are several different types of red buds. Um, within this group here, we've got your native eastern red bud. We've got some forest pansy, which is a cultivar off of the native eastern red bud that has a purple leaf. We also have in the back here some Appalachian red, which you can see is the brighter pink bloom. Um, there are also Chinese red buds. Chinese red buds are going to have a smaller mature size, typically have a little bit of a denser flowering habit to them. Um, we have two cultivars that we carry, Avondale, Avondale and Don, Don Egolf, which is named after the Dr. Donald Egolf from the National Arboretum. Yeah. And it's great to see the variety of flower colors we're getting because the most frequent question I get is, why do we call it red bud if it's really kind of a purplish pink? Well, and that's a great point, David, because actually the Appalachian red red bud, which is one of my favorites, when those buds do start coming out, it is, it's a brilliant red color. And not until they fully open do they really turn to that kind of pinkish tone, but still a much more vivid flower color than the native that we're used to. Yeah. Now, the thing I'm most excited about, of course, all the different leaf colors that are available to us now. Absolutely, and, and I had mentioned the forest pansy, which is your purple leaf cultivar off of the native eastern red bud. Well, there is a naturally occurring variety um, in the Midwest, which we call the Oklahoma red bud. Well, there's a new cultivar off of that called Merlot. Because that's a Midwestern tree and it's out where they're getting a little bit more sun, it has a thicker cuticle on the leaf, which is actually presents as a very glossy leaf. Um, the Merlot is gonna have that glossy leaf, but is gonna be the purple cultivar off of that, off the Oklahoma red bud. So that's a new one that we're very excited about. It's a stunning tree. Great. We've got, I know we've got variegated and some that have yellow leaves. Absolutely. We right. have Rising Sun, which is going to have a brighter gold color leaf, but the new growth is orange. Um, we do. We've got a Silver Cloud, which has a variegated leaf margin. And the leaf shape itself is, is a great highlight of the tree. It's this beautiful heart-shaped leaf. So it gives you a totally different texture in the landscape. And of course, I even like them in wintertime. I think they've got nice structural interest as well. Absolutely, and, and I love them without their foliage on them because you can see in the wintertime this little zigzagging branching habit that the trees have is really gorgeous. Great. Well, another great selection in that realm of very reliable trees gives you interest in all four seasons of the year. I don't know what more you could ask for. Absolutely, and thank you very much, David, for giving me the opportunity right. to highlight these beautiful trees. I know it wasn't easy, but you did a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Beautiful colors of spring there. Well, we talked about trees. Michael had some great suggestions for trees in the first segment. Now we're going to switch over to shrubs. Yes, and we <coughs> may ask the same question. Uh, we're going to go meet Meryl Berman. She uh, has a degree in sustainable landscapes with a real interest in native plants as well as the whole issues of sustainability. So again, she, like all of us, she's a plant lover, right. uh, mm -hmm. but has that kind of as a special focus. And it's tough, you know, when you love plants and you're surrounded by them and you I come out there and say, okay, pick two or three <laughs> that you're gonna show, right. but I want you to show ones that have the diversity, the adaptability for different landscapes, the ones that you can really rely on for good performance. Now, you might notice a little wind noise like we did in that earlier mm -hmm. segment. Uh, sounds like we're out in the mountaintop, but we're really just, <laughs> just at the Fair Oaks Garden that Center. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's see what Merrill has to show us today. Well, now we're out in the shrub section. Again, we're looking for those plants that are tried and true that we know we can rely on in our, in our gardens for a variety of different situations. Give us lots of pleasure. And so today, uh, Merrill's going to join us as soon as she gets here with her selections. Hi, hey, David. Meryl. Hi. Great. So you made some terrific sel selections here. Thank you. Uh, maybe you could introduce us to what we're looking sure. at. Sure. These are two different varieties of Nandina, two different varieties of Spirea, and this is Itea. Fantastic. Well, let's begin at my another cart you're talking about, Nandina. Okay. Um, Nandina is a plant that will grow nicely in sun or shade. It is deer resistant, which is very important for us here in Northern Virginia with lots of deer. Um, there are varieties that will stay short, varieties that will get tall, even as tall as you, with beautiful red berries in the winter. Excellent. It's definitely one of my go-to plants because mm -hmm. I say it is so adaptable and really I almost want to say carefree. I mean, maybe a tiny bit of pruning if I get on some of the older ones, but mm -hmm. other than that, very easy to maintain. Yep, absolutely. Now, let's go to our next plants. Okay, Spirea. They're just like the Nandina, are lots of different varieties of Spirea. 
Um, they either bloom in white or different shades of pink. Um, this is a variety called Magic Carpet that every time it gets new growth, which is several times during the growing season, is orange. So it always looks beautiful. Right, and there are other varieties that have Absolutely. different clean colors and yep. sizes. Yep. Definitely. Right. So again, another one that best out, like I said, in full sun uh -huh. conditions. Full sun and the Nandina sun or shade. Excellent. Though you did say you've been growing this in part shade. Um, in I had sun. it in a in a morning sun up until two o'clock, uh, and then it got shade and it, it still did fine. So it's a tough plant. And that's what's nice when you get them where they adapt to their environments. Yep. And yep. who's this fella? That's Itea. Itea is a native plant, and we're really proud of all the native plants that we have here. Um, because it's a native plant, again, it's very adaptable. Sun or shade, uh, wet or dry soils. It gets a white flower in May and the fall color is beautiful. It's a red. Yeah, I say it's always a pleasure to use native plants. They fit Definitely. in our landscape and yep. that idea is so gorgeous throughout the season. It's really pretty. Well, thank you. I think these are all excellent choices. It, thank you. It wasn't easy. We had to sell so <laughs> yeah. many different shrubs. Yep. I know it took a little thinking to narrow it down to these three. Well, they're great plants. Thanks. Great to get these ideas from our from our experts, and and like you said, she's a she's got a, a graduate degree in this, which is wonderful. Yeah, and that's again, that's the kind of people we like to have on mm -hmm. our staff out there. Uh, so she does do some design consultations right. in house. If you ever have little projects, kind of do it yourself projects, you're looking for ideas, come in. Meryl's one of our many, and there's many others. Just like we're mm -hmm. talking about, so many plants, we have so many great right. people to talk to as well. She's very talented. Just not enough time to show all. That's right. Them. That's right. But while we have a couple minutes in this segment, I took an opportunity for me to pick a couple of mm -hmm. favorites out there as well. Uh, and again, this, this, um, there's so many great plants. These are just some that we wanted to highlight today. So I wanted to show off the uh, Cami Cypress or Hinoki False Cypress. Again, there's many different ones. The one you're looking at right there is Cami Cypress Nucatensis Pendula, uh, kind of a mouthful of a name but it's uh, called the Weeping Nuka False Cypress. I guess that's not even much easier to say. But this you can see, it grows to a pretty big full-size tree. You know, this one that you're looking at there is easily 20 feet tall and it's still young. It could put on another 10 or 12 feet in high. What's done is it's grown for that droop, drooping, pendulous kind of habitat, habit that it has. It's a fantastic specimen plant. Um, I don't see it used very much, but I can tell you it's very easy to care for. It's adaptable to different sites. Uh, we'll grow in full sun like you see there, or it will even tolerate a little bit of shade. And that's typical of all the false cypress. So that's just one of the beautiful specimens. The other one I was going to show you is one that's called Compacta. Uh, Compacta, if we'll go to our next picture here, is a small version of it because we don't, not all of us have the space to put like that big 30 foot footer out there. So here's one that's gonna peak out and mature right about 10 to 12 feet tall. This happens to be at my front door. You know, it's um, townhouse. I didn't want anything that would get much taller than that. Uh, it's been in there for about a good six, seven years and you see it's nice, compact. This one does not get any direct sun at all. It's just living there in that bright filtered shade. So that's a good, easy, carefree plant. And we're talking about versatile, ranging from like 30 feet tall up to the sort of 20 feet tall. And I brought in with me today one that has this golden color to it. Uh, the one that we're showing here on our set is uh, again the Hinoki False Cypress. But here it picks up this nice uh, golden yellow color or tone in the new growth. This again is a compact variety that's only going to grow to about, oh, with, you know, maybe stop at a four or five foot height, more globular in its shape, uh, but has that nice yellow color in there. And then the other I brought just to show you again how diverse this group is. Here's a little miniature guy, same thing, Hinoki False Cypress, only grows about one inch a year. And I don't know, maybe some of us will live long enough to see this reach about three or four feet tall. So that's the Hinoki false cypress, and again, so many varieties. They make great specimen plants that are out there, uh, adaptable to full sun, part shade, and really, you know, reasonably pest free. Now, the next one I wanted to show off was Osmanthus. This is definitely one of my go-to plants in terms of durability. Uh, I did want to show some evergreens. Now, this Osmanthus, sometimes it's called a false holly because it's actually in the olive family, even though it looks like a holly. But here we're talking about a plant 
that's tough and durable once it gets established. Uh, it has really good drought tolerance. It grows in full sun to part shade. Uh, it's deer resistant. You know, it's basically immune to insect and disease problems. It's just been a real, real tried and true proven performer out there. And this one you can see it's grown because it has that variegation in the foliage. Uh, I just brought another one in, sort of by contrast. Uh, this one, uh, you can see it has a little different shape in the leaf. It's gonna grow up to a height of about um, 10, 12 feet. Makes for a nice upright form evergreen hedge. So those are just a couple. Uh, I've kind of used up my time here. We're gonna have to go to a commercial break, but stay with us because when we come back, we're gonna have several more proven performers to show you. Okay, we've talked about trees, we've talked about shrubs. Annuals are, are next. Yeah, we tried to make it around to as many departments as we could, right. and Stephanie, who's been looking after managing our annuals department, has been working with us for years. She's just so enthusiastic mm -hmm. and excited about plants. She's been conducting some workshops here on, yes. you know, the pallet gardening, mm -hmm. vertical gardening, doing container Very gardens, uh, you know, edible plants. You know, she mm -hmm. just loves the whole range of it there, and always has some new creative mm -hmm. ideas for us. So I was just uh, really thrilled to have Stephanie on our team. And went and asked Stephanie the same tough questions. Show us some of those proven performers for us. But, but she got to do more than the two or three. Well, I asked her for two or three, but she <laughs> couldn't limit herself That's to right. just that. <laughs> We're continuing our tour of the garden center looking for plants that are dependable and reliable, give us color through the whole season. And Stephanie's joining us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, so you've been through here, you've been thinking about mm -hmm. this for a while and narrowed down your choice to some of the favorites to share with us today. I have. It was a tough decision, but we pulled together some great summer long color combinations here for you. Uh, tried and true. First, we have the flowering vinca. This is a great plant for full, hot, blazing sun, all summer long color low maintenance, drought tolerant, great for containers and your landscape. Yeah, I, I mentioned I used this in my landscape last year. I always change annuals out. Mm -hmm. I'm just so pleased. I mean, it looked just gorgeous right up to the end of the season. So beautiful and come in so many different colors. I mean, if you can see, these are just a few of the ones that we have to offer right yeah. now. Yeah, it was the soft pink was the one that I used, but yes. this hot pink's nice also. A nice pop in your garden. Yeah, and they really were easy to care, which is important to me. Absolutely. Next we have one of my favorites, the salvia. This one here in particular is the black and blue salvia, which again is great for full hot sun, gives some height to your garden and in your containers. And this will have a nice purple flower later in the season, attracts so many hummingbirds and butterflies. It's amazing. I have this growing on my back deck. Oh, nice. I've always admired it. I've never grown it, but yeah, it sure looks beautiful. beautiful. And, and what's next? Moving along, we've got petunias, but this is not just your everyday petunia. This is a potunia. It's a new variety. And my favorite being the papaya color. Oh, that is distinctive. What I love about this, the potunia, is they stay just like this in this mounded, cute shape. It's not gonna get leggy for you. They're self-cleaning, low maintenance perfect for your container. Oh, I could see doing that even as a low border around the edges it's, too. I it's might perfect have to try that. that out myself. Absolutely. And then something is a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these underused plants here, Plectranthus, is great in sun to shade. Um, one of my favorites, the Cerveza and Lime variety here. Give that a whiff. Oh, that's fabulous. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that really is amazing. I tell you, I've never seen this plant before. And we carry it every year. We carry it every year and it's the first time I've noticed it? Absolutely. Well, I definitely need to get out here more often. Like I said, it's underused. Not a lot of people know of these. Um, they're grown mostly for their um, textured and fragrant foliage, um, but we also have some that flower, like this beautiful Mona Lavender. Yeah, now I've seen this, but I didn't even realize it was the same as the other plants. They look so different. Nobody realizes that they're all a type of Plectranthus. All right, mostly I see that growing in the shade. 
It is. It's a great shade grower. Oh, definitely. Well, put me down for some of those. So order a few extras. I absolutely will. I have to try that because I'm in the shade most part in my garden. Next, we have begonias. And what I love about these begonias, this is your Selenia begonia. And this can not only grow in shade, but full sun as well. Oh, isn't so it? So versatile. Yeah, and these nice bright colors that are there, right? Isn't that beautiful? It comes in an array of color. Okay, and let's keep going. What else do you have for us this morning? And last but certainly not least, we have these uh, caladiums. Gives some great height in your shade garden. Uh, really adds a nice pop to a dark space. Yeah, certainly. I see you got a nice variety, nice selection, these different leaf colors it and patterns. And so many different colors and variegations. It's amazing what you'll find. Fantastic. Well, I sure appreciate you taking time to share some of your favorites and introducing me to some new plants, especially. My pleasure. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And we could not leave out the perennials, so you brought it. You chose a couple of perennials. Yeah, there's just never enough time I to know. fit everything in, and we don't have time to do justice to the perennials. But I could, I would be remiss if not mentioning. So, mm -hmm. again, I took the liberty to pick out a couple right. plants myself to show. The uh, hardy geraniums here, or sometimes called a crane's bill geranium, to me is definitely one of those go-to plants. Uh, again, you'll find they're in a variety of colors, a lot of them sort of in that pinks. Uh, we're getting into lavenders, even white colors. What's nice is it kind of trails and sprawls around the ground, along the ground. To me, it does best, again, where it gets a little bit of uh, protection from the full day sun, but it will grow basically in full day to half day sun. And it's, it's almost, almost evergreen. The foliage holds up late in the year, but then in early spring, I do go in there, give it a pretty severe haircut, yeah, very and allow nice it to come back. This, this yeah, and you'll get a long bloom season out mm -hmm. of there. Another one that I wanted to show off um, is this verbena. Yes, I love verbena. Uh, you can see it's this big sprawler. It trails along the ground. The reason I selected this is because for, in terms of flower power, this guy's just like unbeatable. Mm -hmm. It just sprawls and sprawls. I mean, they'll go to about three foot across and to cover up big patches of ground, just loaded with blossoms all summer long. It's sold as a perennial, but I prefer to think of it as an annual. Sometimes it's used this term tender perennial. Thing is, if you put it in the ground, you have maybe a 50-50 chance of it really surviving the winter gotcha. this far north. But it's got grows so rapidly, so vigorously, and has so many blossoms. I plant it in my garden every year just as an annual to uh, attract the butterflies it's in beautiful. there. Beautiful, beautiful. Can you do one more? Okay, I got plenty more. It's just I know, I know we're going to run out of time here. I wanted to show real super quick Euphorbia, another one of those really proven performers. I use Euphorbia in my garden because it is a great shade plant, uh, and. You can see the foliage that's on there. It's got nice uh, green foliage. Some of them are evergreen, some are variegated. And you get this interesting blossom that forms now. But it will persist and stay all the way in there until about late summer when I get tired of looking at it. And that's when I go in and give a haircut. But for dry shade, which is a tough environment, they're very deer resistant. These euphorbias are great. They also work well in containers. Super. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls. So give us a call, 703-387-1046. We'll be right back. It's phone call time, so if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046. And David, our first caller is George, who's calling from Silver Spring. Hi, George. Good morning. Well, good morning. How are you doing? Great. Love your show. Oh, totally thank love you. It. Thank you for everything you do. My question today is about a fig tree that I've had growing for about a decade out in the yard, <clears throat> and I can never figure out why all the figs are, uh, are gone. It seems that they fall off the tree, but I never see them on the ground. So I started wondering if they're being eaten by uh, birds or squirrels. And I just saw a squirrel there the other day. So anyway, I'm trying to do the netting thing. Unfortunately, I let the tree go real high, so it's almost ridiculous. But I'm getting some of the lower branches, but I wanted some advice. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, I was suspect of the squirrels as soon as you, you said, hey, the figs are gone, but they're not sitting on the ground. Right. Yeah. So um, how, can I, how can we help you with that? Sounds like the netting, I mean, that's kind of works in my experience. A lot of times they'll get under it and still grab the fruit. 
Uh, there are repellents you know, that you can use even on fruits and vegetables. Uh, there's one that's made with hot pepper. To me, that one, um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, there's trial and error. I've heard of some people where the squirrels, even the hot pepper, they're sitting there with their eyes dripping from the heat and all that, but they can't stop themselves. Yeah, so okay. with, is that what you were asking about? Well, I was just not sure uh, whether I was that was the best thing to do, the netting. Uh, I'm able to do it, um, and it, um, I wasn't sure that was the best thing or some repellent or... Uh, or what? Yeah, I found usually it takes a combination of strategies. It's no one answer. I think the netting is helpful as a deterrent, but sometimes they still find their way under it. So maybe you can even find then you do that in combination uh, with it. Okay. Uh, there's another product that's called uh, from a company called I Must Garden. It's a squirrel repellent. You could also try that one. I've used that in my own gardening. But again, with these repellents, there is a measure of trial and error. But they're all natural. There's nothing toxic in it. You can wash it right off the fruit and still enjoy it. Okay, sounds great. Maybe I'll do both things and um, and see what happens. And it's probably going to give you best results to do them in combination. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, and good luck with that. Hope you get to enjoy the figs this year. <laughs> If I do, I'll bring some into the center. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, our next caller is Jean. I'm not sure where you're calling from, Jim. Oh, Potomac. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. What can we do for you today? Well, I have the Hotunia chameleon. Uh, I know that it's an invasive plant. It has gotten out of control, and I can't seem to eradicate it. Yeah, you're talking about the... Um what I call hutinia. It's got the multiple colored leaves and it kind of yes, creeps and spreads. Yes, a little white uh, flower. Yeah, that, that's a beast of a plant. Um, I've been always very, very careful and cautious about using that in the garden because it, once it gets started, it is very difficult, which means, uh, quite honestly, almost impossible to eradicate. Um, I think, you're, again, just like you're talking about the squirrels, in this case, you're going to need to use probably a combination of strategies. Whatever you're able to achieve by hand digging and physically removing, uh, but it's hard to get everything. Uh, in combination, you can try using the Roundup Poison Ivy Killer uh, as a chemical option. So it's going to take a combination of persistence, digging, and spraying, and uh, it's kind of a lesson learned about using that. Oh my plant. God, yeah. Somebody gave me a little cutting and it has spread throughout my yard. Um, and I, I was digging yesterday. We, uh, two to three inches deep, and it's amazing how uh, intertwined uh, the underground <laughs> roots are, yeah. and it's, it's just very, very hard to get rid of. That, that's why, you know. And that's the problem, like that Roundup uh, Poison Ivy Killer, of course, that kills um, anything you spray it on. So if you get that onto your flowers, they're dead also. That's a plant that I think needs to be contained inside of a container or a pot, you know, not allowed to just run loose through your garden. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You've been very helpful. Okay. I appreciate that. I wish I had a little more upbeat news for you, but uh, we've been fighting that one for years. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank Take you. Take care. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze one more in. Barbara is calling from Rockville. Hi, Barbara. Do you have a quick question? Uh, I listen to your program every week, and I love your beautiful flowers and trees. Your program is very special. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. I applied Turf Builder with Crab Preventer about a month ago, and my lawn is beautiful, but now I have a lot of clover, which I'd love to get rid of. And what do I put on to get rid of the clover? Well, first of all, I'm going to say get rid of clover. You're going to be better off with the spray products as opposed to any of the granular ones. Oh, bummer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know not it, people sometimes don't like the sprays, but you get better coverage, better absorption with it. And you can use either one that's called Speed Zone, just, you know, like it says, S-P-E-E-D-Z-O-N-E. -E -E. So Speed Zone is from Gordon's, or Bonide makes one they call Weed Beater Ultra. They're the same product from two different companies. Either one of those will give you good results without harming uh, your grass. And one other thing I want to say is that uh, weed preventer you put down, keep in mind that's going to give you good results for maybe about 12 weeks. So you may need to do a second application by midsummer. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for the call.
Have a great weekend. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of your calls. Stay tuned. Okay, let's quickly get back to our callers. Joe is calling from Centerville. Hi, Joe. Hi. How are uh, you? Good morning. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I believe um, I mentioned this before. I think I ran into David at the Giant Store. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe, that's right. He lives in Centerville. Oh, I sure do. <laughs> I live right up there across the <laughs> Anyway, I have a tree in the backyard. I believe it's a crab apple tree, and it has these white blossoms on it, white blooms on it. Right. And I don't particularly like white. Um, is there any way to change the color in the blooms or what? No, that's, that's pretty much fixed by the genetics of the tree. Now, there are crab apples that come in a variety of cor colors. They've got some beautiful, that go from a, a deep crimson red to a pink to the white. But unfortunately, or, mm -hmm. or fortunately, yours is white. It's always going to be white. Uh, the only way you're going to change the color is to come in and get a new yeah. tree. Oh, well. Okay. That's all I need to know. <laughs> all, all right, right Thank Joe. You Thanks so much for the call. I'll be looking for you at the grocery That's store. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Let's see. Our next caller is Kathy, who's calling from Silver Spring. Hi, Kathy. Hi. How are you? Great. And you? Good, good. Um, I have problems with uh, Japanese beetles, and I'd like to know what annuals to use in shade okay. that uh, the Japanese beetles don't it wasn't that like right. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. I'm kind of thinking through it in my head. Um, I think you'd be pretty safe using begonias. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to think the beetles more of a problem than, oh, the trees and shrubs, you know, like roses and such. But uh, begonias would be a good one for shade. Uh, again, coleus. Uh, and I really haven't seen any kind of beetle problems there. Uh, just trying to think through some others. Of course, in the perennial section, even though I know they're, they're perennials, but you know, all things like heuchera, the, some of those that we showed today, like the uh, euphorbia. So there, there's a lot of choices out there for you that the beetles should leave alone. Okay, thank you so much. All right, good luck with that. And hopefully, hopefully we maybe we'll escape the beetles this yeah. year. It seems like some years are worse than others. Yeah. Have a great weekend, bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Uh, Joanne is calling from Springfield. Hi, Joanne. Hello. How are you uh, this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. <clears throat> um, I walk around with my dog in our neighborhood, suburban neighborhood, on a circuit that's one quarter of a mile, and I do it three times, twice a day, and there are a lot of um, uh, dandelions there. And last year, from the time they came out until November, I picked the heads off of them, and this year they came back in force. There are five, at least four or five dandelions for every one that was there last year. Is that because I picked the heads off them? No, that really has nothing to do. Picking the heads off of them over time will reduce the population, but what happens with most of these weeds, uh, those seeds remain viable for several years. So let's say, you know, like a colleague of mine says, one year of weeds means seven years of weeding. So if those dandelions, let's say they are allowed to flower, the seeds mature, and then those seeds uh, disseminate out into the landscape, that means there's enough seed there that's going to remain viable for sev several years, you know, five years, mm -hmm. six, seven years. So even though you're removing the future seed bank, there's still enough seeds left there to, to survive year after year. Plus the dandelion's a perennial, so that mother plant continues to come back from the same root system. Oh. Uh, and and I, while well, I encourage what you're doing, uh, a lot of times this is why people end up you know, resorting to using different herbicides. And one of the things I wanted to mention, if it ever fits into your walk or your, your goals there, there is an organic, um, completely natural herbicide. It's from a company it's called Whitney Farms. Uh, we sell it at our garden centers, but the Whitney Farms is a selective weed killer that will kill dandelions without harming the grass, and it's an organic product, because I know you're walking your dog in there. That might just be another thing to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, keep up the good work. You are, you are <laughs> doing some good. It's just uh, going to take years to see the payoff for it. Okay. Thanks again. Have okay. a great weekend. Okay, let's see. I believe Patty is next from Bethesda. Is that right, Patty? 
Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. Sure. How are I'm you? I'm excited to get some advice from you. Um, I have a shrub in my yard here in Bethesda that when I moved in, the owner and some of the neighbors told me it was something called a flowering or an ornamental pomegranate. Okay. And the first year I was here, it bloomed. It had beautiful red blooms on it. And, and since then, it hasn't bloomed, and I wonder if it's because I'm trimming it too heavily. It, it tends to grow pretty high and bump into a dogwood tree that I have. So um, I was wondering if you have any experience with a ornamental pomegranate. Yes, the uh, pomegranates are marginal in their cold hardiness. It's traditionally a uh, plant for southern regions. But uh, there's been a lot of varieties that were bred, particularly over in Russia. They developed some really cold hardy varieties that we now have available and will survive our winters. So you can lose buds just from during severe cold. Uh, winter damage is uh, most often the cause for it. In regards to pruning, if you're going to prune it, you would want to do that immediately after the flowering time because they do set their buds in late season. So if you are pruning it uh, either late in the year or early in the year, that could be a problem. I'm told we're out of we time. We are out of time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for the call. Okay. Have a great weekend. Thank you all for joining us. Great ideas today. And thanks to Stephanie, Michael, and uh, Merrill for, for their suggestions, too. Uh, hope you'll go by the seminars this weekend at our Gainesville location. Andre Viet at 1.30 today. Paul McLean on Roses tomorrow at 1. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.